Amen. While most people associate Sabbath school with the study of the Bible and the Sabbath school lessons, one of the most important components of Sabbath school is a focus on mission. That's both global mission and community outreach. And many churches do a great job of incorporating mission reports and mission education into the Sabbath school and of supporting financially world mission through mission offerings. We praise the Lord for what churches are doing around the world. But if this is all we do, it doesn't necessarily reach the full potential of Sabbath school. You see, not only can mission be a part of Sabbath school, but Sabbath school can be a part of the mission. In other words, when local churches make evangelistic plans, they can incorporate Sabbath school into their strategies as a powerful means of growing the church. In Councils on Sabbath School Work, page 9, Ellen White wrote, The influence growing out of Sabbath school work should improve and enlarge the church. Did you catch that? The Sabbath school should enlarge the church. This is exactly what happened when a church in the Chinese Union Mission decided to make Sabbath school an integral part of their mission strategy. Let's listen to their story. China is a big country with a population of 1.4 billion people. This is a Sunday church building in China. But a Seventh-day Adventist church is allowed to use it on Sabbath for worship. This Seventh-day Adventist church has about 200 members worshipping here. For the past 10 years, this church had only about 15 to 22 people baptized annually. To some, it may sound like a pretty good church growth, but the church pastor and the church board were not satisfied with it. They started to pray for church growth. The church pastor met with the Sabbath school director and requested counsel and assistance regarding church growth for the church. After some communication, the Sabbath school director invited the church pastor and the church board to pray for the following. To elect two devoted Sabbath school superintendents, to call for two dedicated Sabbath school secretaries, to look for 30 caring Sabbath school teachers. Each class will have three teachers. Council to Sabbath school work says, the Sabbath school should be one of the greatest instrumentalities and the most effectual in bringing souls to Christ. After the learning and training, all these lovely teachers are ready to accept God's invitation. I will go. To begin the change for Sabbath school, they divided all the Sabbath school members into 10 classes, and three teachers took care of each class. They begin with only 10 Sabbath school classes. After six months, classes that reach 30 people or above will be split up into two classes, and new teachers are added to all these new classes. Starting with 10 classes, now, they have 12 classes and 36 teachers in total. More and more individuals from the classes started studies using the Bible study guide. The Sabbath school did not only focus on Bible study, but also has quarterly fellowship, such as birthday celebrations, hiking, sport day, and outdoor activities. Today, they have a total of 30 Sabbath school classes they also truly experience the highest objective of Sabbath school. The object of Sabbath school work should be the ingathering of souls, according to Council for Sabbath School Work. The story did not end here. They did not forget the other aspect of the Sabbath school, community service. Through this outreach, they brought the good news to different communities and started planting new fellowship groups and new churches. God has blessed this church in an extraordinary way by doubling the attendance number of this church in just two and a half years via the Sabbath school, increasing the baptism number from 15 or 22 a year 
to 60 or 100 a year. If they can do it with the power of the Holy Spirit to activate their Sabbath school by doubling their attendance in two and a half years, why can't we? May the Holy Spirit unite us together in His love and obey Him and say, I will go.
We often say that Sabbath school is the heart of the church. And the heart of Sabbath school is the study of the lesson. The foundation is the Bible. It is an honor for me to introduce to you our GC session Sabbath school panel. Pastor Justin Kim is the newly elected Associate Director of Sabbath School and Personal Ministries Department and Editor of the Young Adult Inverse Bible Study Guide for the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventist Church. He has been a missionary, a pastor, and director of multiple departments, a husband to Rachel, and a father of two boys. He is the host of Inverse Program and Hope Channel, and the co-founder of GYC. He is a lover of books and an enemy of cilantro. So please, no cilantro for Pastor Kim. You may want to wave Pastor Kim so they can get to know you. Sebastian Braxton is a UX designer, international speaker, and a serial entrepreneur. He's the founder of Fialux, a creative design agency that consults with faith-based uh, organizations to leverage technology for the gospel. He resides in North Carolina, United States, with his wife, Candice, and their four children. You might want to wave, Sebastian, Hello. thank you. Sikudako is currently a stay-at-home mother who lives in Maryland with her husband, Archie, and their four children. Siku is a former senior editorial assistant for Inverse. She has a master's in religion from Andrews University and a bachelor's degree from Wesley College in French and biochemistry. Her passions include ministry to young people, editorial work, and learning new skills. It is her desire to use all her skills and her gifts to hasten Christ's soon return. May want to wave Siku. And last but not least, <laughs> Jonathan Walter. He is originally from Austria, has pastored in the United States and served as a missionary for the Marshall Islands. He also served as a vice president for GYC. Since 2019, he has been part of the General Conference Ministerial Association. He loves involving young people in Bible study and missions. Jonathan is happily married to Amanda, and they recently welcomed their first child into the world. Amen. Welcome to our Sabbath School uh, panel, and thank you for leading us into the study of the Word of God. And I know this will be a blessing. Amen. Muchas gracias, Pastor Canals. ¿Cómo están ustedes? Bienvenidos a Sabbath School. Uh, it's my privilege to be here with all of you. Taja Hao, and City Kwaila. Sangdo Yoruban, Anyazeo. And welcome to every one of you to our Sabbath School time. I'd like to give some time for my panelists and my friends to also greet you in their native language, <laughs> Siku. Okay. Salut bonani, sabatelile, bon saba, and sabatarakanaka, tinobonga marikuti tiripanoteshe, tichimukuza, ngezuare sabatariner. Jonathan. Gesegneten Sabbat euch allen and will sing it Sabbat. Happy Sabbath. Wagwan. <laughs> Wagwan. It's a great privilege to be before you, all of here, all of you today. We want to get into scripture. We want to say thank you, special thanks to the Adult Bible Study Guide Office for having prepared this wonderful Bible study on the book of uh, Genesis. So if you have your Bibles, and this is general conference session, you should all have your Bibles. Please turn them on or turn to Genesis chapter 37. 
We know you have been involved in a lot of business this week and you are a bit tired. But we, this is what we do as Adventists. We study the Word of God. Amen. So I want to encourage you to open your Bibles and engage in Scripture with us. Before we read Scripture, we're going to have a word of prayer. And Sebastian, if you can pray for us, please. Yes, let us pray. Mighty God, everlasting Father, we are privileged to be alive on this blessed Sabbath. Lord, we have, co- we have not come to hear the words of men, but we have come to hear the word of God. We invite the sweet, sweet spirit of Jesus to rest upon this place and to move from heart to heart and from mind to mind, impressing the word of God upon our souls and sanctifying us in preparation for his soon coming. Guide us, be with our thoughts, And in our understanding is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Siku, if you can read from verse 1 of Genesis chapter 37 and uh, 1 and 2, please. Let's get started. Yes, please. Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. Mm -hmm. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Jonathan, we have, uh, you're a pastor, and uh, we have preached, I, I'm assuming, many times from the book of Genesis. And there's many people here, uh, we're, we're covering the story of Joseph. This is a, a, a perennial favorite for many. Mm. Uh, and then some people are thinking, eh, we're going to talk about Joseph. Uh, we're starting off in Genesis 37 here. Mm-hmm. Uh, give us some insights how this story, how this narrative st- uh, begins, how it commences. Mm-hmm. Well, we are here now. Joseph is a fourth generation patriarchal Adventist. Mm. Okay, we had Abraham, we had Jacob, Isaac. 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 Yes, it's all right. Just making okay, sure you're all church. awake. <laughs> we had Isaac, Jacob, and now Joseph. And uh, it's very interesting to see in the book of Genesis how the story of God's people begins yes. and how throughout the generations some things are passed on. Yes. Uh, the promises of God, the covenant is renewed, and, and, but also some of the bad things are being passed on, yes. the lying and uh, you know, all, all kinds of issues. And some of these dynamics are now being played out as the people of God are growing. It started with one child, Isaac, and now we have you know, Jacob and his 12 sons. And there are some dynamics at play here in Genesis 37 that uh, really set up the people of Israel as we come to the book of Exodus. Let's flush that out a bit, the dynamics, the family dynamics. In verse 2, it says, He was still a youth along with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Mm. Zilpah, his father's wives. Siku, share more about these family dynamics. Uh, What is the, the drama, the underlying going on here? I mean, you have in chapter 35, the, the names of these sons of Bilhah and Zilpah. Yes. It's Dan, Naphtali, and then Gad and Asher. Yeah. Right? If we're looking back in, in previous chapters, we already have seen Reuben doing shady things. Mm. Um, we've seen Simeon and Levi doing not just shady things, but um, disastrously shady things. Yeah. Um, right. As in, the, the, these sons of Jacob have... Um, a history of doing things that are not in accordance with God's will, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And if we didn't know before, now we know that even Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher are part of that crew. Mm -hmm. So all the sons of Leah, the sons of Zilpah, the sons of Bilhar are doing these things that are against God's law. Yes. But it tells us that Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father, meaning that Joseph was not a part of their shenanigans. He wasn't a part of their bad behavior. But not only was he not a part of it, it so troubled him that he went so far as to bring a report to his father in the hopes that he could encourage his brothers to do the right thing. So even though Joseph was born into this family with siblings who were making bad choices, even though he was in a situation, in a circumstance that was wicked, that was evil in his own family, Joseph was of a different character. Mm -hmm. Joseph had a different mindset. He was trying to do things differently. And if I could point out, like one of the lessons that comes out to me in this is that Joseph was not controlled by his circumstances. Mm. He wasn't shaped by the environment that he was (laughs) in. There was something 
above the environment that he was in that shaped him. Because if he was shaped by his environment, you just copy what his brothers were doing. Mm -hmm. But he answered to a superior power, and we see that later on throughout his life. Yes. But the, the seeds of it are right here, that Joseph, in his own family, didn't follow just what his brothers did, just whatever his dad did, just whatever. That even though his family was messed up, that he rose above the circumstances yes. that he was born into. I love that scripture shows a family that is messed up. How many yes. of you are from a messed up family? Please raise your hands. Uh, we are Seventh-day Adventists. We have wonderful families, but there are we are entering into a world that has more blended families, more creative families, and I believe this family is one of the, the weirdest combination of families, yes? Absolutely. Four wives, one wife is loved by the other, half-brothers, and it's just interesting dynamic. Mm. Let's read verse 3 and 4. Sebastian, if you can read verse 3 and 4, I'm going to continue how crazy this family is. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. Mm. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak mm. peaceably to him. So there's some more drama going on here. Yeah, there is um, interfamily dynamics here. In verse 4, the brothers saw that their father loved him more than the brothers, so they hated him. They hated him. Mm. I got a copy of this uh, commentary, the Andrews Bible commentary that just came out. I just heard that there's a sold out in the bookstore here. And it references that in verse 4, that's that they hated him, mm. that him could be either Joseph or their father. Yep. And it's a little bit unclear, but it could be either or or both. Yeah, probably both. Yeah. Probably both, yeah. There's some, there some weird stuff going on here. And you know, Justin, yep. one of the things that, you know, I, I, I come from a blended family. And I remember my 16th birthday, my, my stepmother came home. I was uh, there kind of doing my morning chores thinking, oh, once I finish my chores, you know, I'll be able to go out and have fun and do what I want to do because it's my birthday, right? But she comes home, they hand me some gifts, and after she hands me the gifts, she takes my younger siblings, her children, and they go out to eat and tells me that I need to cut the two acres of grass before she returns. Well. And I remember thinking about the fact that when it says that Israel loved Joseph more than his brothers, there's a difference between Israel feeling that way internally and them being able to see that he loved them, he, they loved, that he loved Joseph more than them. Mm -hmm. It became visible. It became something that was undeniable. And in that moment, it not only creates tension with the parent, but it creates tension even among your siblings. Mm. And you realize that in this family dynamic is a revelation of why heaven is going to be a blessed place. Mm -hmm. Because the relationship that Jesus has with the Father is not something you and I need to be jealous of. Mm. This is not something that is not attainable. And this is why Jesus himself told us that the Father himself loves you. Just as he told Jesus, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This is great hope for each one of us. Uh, we're setting the context. We have to cover about five chapters. I don't think we have enough time to do all that. But the context is this. In the midst of a bad marriage, in the midst of siblings fighting over a parental inheritance uh, uh, legal matter, in the midst of perhaps a church family in, 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 in tension, God can bring blessing out of evil. Yes. God saves Israel in the midst of family drama. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. That Amen. is the context. We're going to go, and you all know the story. We're going to go to, or skip down to verse 5. Joseph had a dream. Verse 9, he still had another dream. Joseph has these two dreams that show the supernaturality of, of this experience. Jonathan, mm -hmm. where is God in this chapter? You know, this is a very good question. Uh, throughout the chapters, we don't hear too much about God. We hear the story of Joseph unfolding in Egypt, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and also in Genesis 38 with Judah and Tamar. And the question is, where is God? Mm. Now, I believe just because God might not be always visible or active externally, it does not mean that he's not active present mm. uh, and working internally Amen. because we see throughout these chapters of 37 and forward a development of character in, Joseph, in Joseph's life and 
in the brothers, especially mm. Judah and some of the others, mm -hmm. which is incredibly hopeful because you might feel like, where is God? Is he even here? Is he even active in my life? Yes. But we can know that he's at work in our hearts as we, as we walk with him, even when we don't always see him, even when we don't always notice his presence. Uh, I had a time in my life where uh, as a young person trying to figure out what to do with my life, and I'm sure there are many who ask that question you know, at 18, 19 years old, and I prayed and I was trying to figure this out for like a year and God would not answer me. I asked for signs and asked for this and that and <laughs> nothing, nothing. I was presumptions, really. And so, but what I didn't realize was that in the process, God was doing something in my heart. He was converting me, trying to help me get to know him and to seek him on a daily basis. He was, he was doing something else. I didn't realize what he was doing in my life. Mm. So just because God is not always externally visible or, mm. or um, seen or, or noticed does not mean he's not at work in people around us and in our own hearts. Mm. I, Siku, go for it. Um, and just to, to jump off of what he was saying, mm -hmm. you look at Joseph's story and by the time you get to chapter 39 um, and his faithfulness, even when he was in captivity, even as a slave, that the people, rec people around him recognized mm. that mm. God was there in yes. his life, mm -hmm. yep. right? So it may not be like, oh, you know, and then God performed this miracle yes. and etc. But in the faithfulness of Joseph, God was there. Mm -hmm. I think in a world that is so sinful and with the craziness that the world is right now, in the faithfulness of God's people, God is there. Mm -hmm. And God's people become that, you know, we are we're like preservers of the image of God on this earth. Amen. And so that is where God is. God is in the midst of his people, even mm -hmm. though it may seem that he is silent otherwise. Mm -hmm. and, and if I could just Go add on. to that, yeah. God is through his covenant. He has pledged himself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Mm -hmm. Even though they have all these toxic dynamics, he is there and he's faithful to them even when they are unfaithful to each other and to him. Yes. And that gives me great hope as well because it shows a merciful and patient God and he's willing to work with us even when we are sometimes struggling with various issues in our lives and our families. You know what's weird is that we have Abraham, we all love Abraham, we have Isaac, we all love Isaac, we have Jacob, we all, uh, Jacob, we all love Jacob, and then we have Joseph, and as Adventists we love Joseph, but it's interesting that Jesus does not come in the line of Joseph, mm -hmm. but he comes in the line of Judah. Yeah. Yep. In verse chapter 37, verse 26, Chapter 37, verse 26, it is Judah mm. who says to his brothers, what profit is it for us to kill our brother and cover up his blood? Very interesting, chapter 38, the entire chapter is a weird chapter, an unusual chapter, and I don't know <laughs> if we can discuss all the dynamics of chapter 38 as a world church, Amen. but it is about the character of yeah. Judah, yes? Yeah. Judah was someone who wanted to get lost. He goes out there and in the midst of this family drama, he wants to get away from it all. He gets into his Tamar discussion. And the interesting thing is, guys, that there are many scholars out there who refuse to acknowledge that chapter 38 should be even in the Bible. Mm. Oh, wow. They said that this is so awkward. This is not part of the Joseph narrative. Perhaps, according to documentary hypothesis, that this <laughs> chapter was not even in the original document. Mm. And so they do revision and they do gymnastics to take this, this chapter out. But what's very interesting that Judah is just, a, 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 just as a char main character as Joseph is. Yeah, that's right. Because you see that Judah has a conversion experience in chapter 38, verse 26. Yes. Where he re recognizes his own unrighteousness and the righteousness of somebody else. Mm -hmm. And this begins this conversion process where later in chapter 44, yes. his story is so tied into Joseph that he becomes the intercessor mm -hmm. for his younger brother. Yes. And, and you Jesus know, comes in the line of Judah. Amen. He comes in the line of intercessors yes. for mm. lost people. And I think Amen. that's just so awesome. The two brothers work together to illustrate the story of salvation. Amen. Uh, Sebastian. Yeah, I was just going to add, Justin, the beauty of that, going back to Jonathan and Siku's point, is that God is working not just in the midst of his people, but also in the midst of a family. Yes. Yes. When sometimes many of us are the only faithful person in our family, and you see that God used Joseph, the one faithful person, to preserve all of them when famine came. And he was the one who was quick to forgive. He was the one that was quick to see, I'm not going to assume you are the same. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you an opportunity to grow. 
to prove yourself true to principle. And sometimes we can get stuck and bogged down in the mistakes of our family members in the past. Mm -hmm. And we don't let them grow beyond that. Mm -hmm. And so you see that God was in the midst of Joseph's faithfulness, speaking to him, moving in his 17 year old life, which years later into his thirties would become a critical factor to preserve the genealogy of Jesus mm -hmm. so that Jesus could come mm -hmm. because of his willingness to forgive mm -hmm. and to be reconciled. So you see the contrast that Joseph was there before Judah, but they both had a part to play. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, God was working even in the midst of a broken family. Special, let me read you uh, this quote from uh, Spirit of Prophecy. Testimonies, volume six, page 219. And I just found it this morning. I think it must be of interest. We do have many leaders of the church. Not many, all the leaders of the church are here and we have institutional <laughs> heads. And Sister White says this, every institution established by Seventh-day Adventists is to be to the world what Joseph was in Egypt wow. mm. and what Daniel and his fellows were in Babylon. As in the providence of God, these chosen ones were taken captive, and it was to carry to heathen nations the blessings that come to humanity through a knowledge of God. They were to be the representatives of Jehovah. Amen. As we look at the Joseph narrative, and we see Judah is struggling, and he gets into weird stuff. While this is happening, Joseph is being tempted by Mrs. Potiphar and the jail experiences. <laughs> What are some principles, what are some leadership principles that we can extract from this uh, passage that many institutions and many Seventh-day Adventists need to embrace, especially in these last days? We'll start with Sebastian, go down. Mm -hmm. God always keeps his promises. Mm. If leaders, institutions always built their vision, their work, their strategy on the promises of God, God will not fail you. Mm. His promise is that when a man's ways please the Lord, he will make his enemies be at peace. Mm -hmm. That the blessing of the Lord maketh rich and he adds no sorrow. That those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Amen. So therefore, I look at Joseph's experience and see someone who believed and trusted God's promises, mm -hmm. was willing to live faithful as the condition of those promises and how God led even through tragic low and dark moments and eventually led him exactly to what God wanted him to be. Amen. Amen. Uh, you know, one lesson that I learned and that I want to prioritize my life and understand uh, experientially really is the fact that circumstances do not inhibit God at working. Mm. Dude, from Joseph's perspective, he felt his life was over, a mess. He was faithful through it all, but the circumstances were horrible. Yeah. Being in prison, un, you know, mm -hmm. unjust, it's, it's just unfair, right? Yes. But God is at work. It says in chapter 39, verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man. Mm. And he was the house, you know, in the house of the Egyptian master. So we see that God can work even in the dark moments when the things that we perceive as this is the end of the road, it's just the beginning. God is setting something, something up for the future. And as leaders, we can trust that God is at work even when we go through the valley of really dark circumstances. Mm. And that yeah. just gives me great encouragement. Amen. Amen. Um, for me, in the life of Joseph is his faithfulness. Um, Jonathan mentioned the word faithfulness. Mm -hmm. Is not just his faithfulness when he finally came to be the prince of Egypt, you know, but his faithfulness in small things and his faithfulness in, in the moments when nobody was looking, his mm -hmm. faithfulness in a jail cell, his faithfulness when, when the rest of the world would have thought you have every reason to not be faithful. Mm -hmm. That is when he was faithful. And I think if as leaders in every sphere that we are in, so I'm a leader in my home, in my Amen. small sphere. That's right. yep. If I can be faithful in the little things that God has called me to, then God adds his blessing to that faithfulness mm. and it results in success that the world sees. And so with the quote that you were reading that we're called to be, our institutions are called to be these lights to the world. Our homes are called to be these lights to the world. Our churches are called to be these lights to the world. But we cannot do that unless we are faithful to God in the small things. And as a counterpoint to Joseph's yes. faithfulness, we have that narrative right there in, in chapter 38, which, which highlights you know, Judah's lack of trust in God, lack of focus on God's will and following mm -hmm. his promises, etc. But if we can be faithful, faithful in the little things, I think that's the key to our success 
in God giving us success mm-hmm. in the work mm-hmm. that we're doing for mm-hmm. Him. Mm-hmm. And when we look at the story as it you know comes to a conclusion, it always tears me up when I see the forgiveness that takes place. Mm. As leaders, we need to be able to forgive, uh, to reconcile, and take that first step, even though we were the one being mistreated or whatever the situation is, Joseph manifests a Christ-like character in his dealings with his brothers. Uh, and, you know, very, very powerful, uh, that moment of reconciliation and his willingness to, to bless them and to, to bring them back and provide for them. Uh, that's, uh, it's really beautiful. The higher he went into power, the, the broader and more spacious was his heart to forgive. That's yes. right. I'd like to I'll bring your attention to a couple of verses in chapter 39. Chapter 39, verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph. Mm -hmm. Verse 21, the Lord was with Joseph. Verse 23, the Lord was with him. This is a reoccurring motif, the Lord was with him. But I believe the secret is found in verse 9. Even the Lord was with Joseph. Joseph was aware that the Lord was with him. So it's, Mm -hmm. the Lord is always with us. But it's another thing for us to be aware of that. And in verse 9, he says this classic question that we all are very familiar with. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God, even though there was no one else in that room except for him and Mrs. Potiphar? We don't know her name, but of course we call her Mrs. Potiphar. (laughs) That he knew that God was in that room with us. Mm. And this is the call to all of us to, in the midst of our faithfulness in small things, in the spaciousness of of forgiveness, in the spaciousness of, of righteousness, living in the midst of the circumstances, we need to be aware, cognizant of this silent presence. I love this quote from uh, this commentary. It says that silence is not absence. Amen, friends? Silence is not absence. And we need to fill our hearts and minds with the word of God, God's promises, and continue to dwell in his presence on that. How many of you today want to say, Lord, I know you're with me. But I want to know, I want to embrace your presence, even though it's silent. Help me, Lord Jesus. Please raise your hands right now. Amen. Amen. God bless each one of you. Let us have a word of prayer. Gracious Father, in the midst of the spectacle, and as we are gathered here in a big dome, and there's lights, and there's cameras, Father, at the end of the day, we are a simple people seeking your presence. Father, we ask, As a people, grant us the gift of your faithfulness. We know that Jesus' faithfulness has been given to us and imputed and imparted. Father, help us to enact that in everyday things as mothers and fathers of little children and also as presidents and vice presidents of large organizations and institutions. Grant us the gift of faithfulness. We ask humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless each one of you. Thank you. Amen. We began our Sabbath school this morning by reviewing the great gospel commission out of Matthew. And we're going to end by reviewing um, through music our commitment to fulfilling that commission. Uh, We know that we have a task that is unfinished, right? We've seen all the reports. We know how much progress. It's wonderful, but there's still a lot of work to be done. So I invite you to stand with me. We're going to sing together some words that were penned in about 1920. In um, trying to recruit missionaries, this song was done as a missionary recruitment. It's put to a familiar tune, so if you've never heard the words before, just sing along because you're going to know the tune. Um, We're going to be led by the GC Chorale on the screen. Please join me as we sing.
Amen. Would you please bow your heads with me? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for being here with us, making your presence felt. And we pray that, Father, you would help us as we move forward with the mission you've entrusted to us to see the power of Sabbath school. We pray that you would help us to be sure that the foundation of Sabbath school is Bible study and prayer, that the format of Sabbath school is one of fellowship, and that the focus of Sabbath school is the mission. And Lord, please revive our Sabbath schools and revive our hearts, we pray. We thank you for your word, and we pray that as we continue today, that you would reveal yourself to us through it and speak to our hearts, each one, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I would invite you to stretch your arms and your legs, but don't wander too far because there will just be a very short uh, intermission here before the worship service begins. It will begin shortly. Thank you and God bless you.
We are going to praise God or continue to praise God with a sequence of hymns. Please be aware of the scripture lecture and be aware when women will sing and be aware when men will sing and we invite you to praise God together. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and exalt your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. Oh, 
majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have placed, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Humans being that you care for them. You have made them little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky proclaims the work of His hand. Oh Lord my God, when I am awesome wonder, consider all the world Thy hands have made. I see the stars, I keep them rolling thunder, the power of the universe display. Then sing my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sing my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art. My soul, my Savior, God, to thee. 
Shabbat Shalom, dear brothers and sisters. I would like to invite you to worship our Heavenly Father, our Almighty God. And this is the reason why I invite you also to take a seat so that we can together worship in unity, in diversity, and uplift the beauty of God's character. Thank you for taking the position for worship. Psalm 138 says, I will give you thanks with all my heart. I will sing you praise before the entire universe. I will bow down toward your sanctuary and give thanks to your name for your constant love and truth. You have exalted your name and your promise above everything else. For we call and you answer to our prayers. May our minds and hearts be focused exclusively on God and the beauty of his character. May we uplift his love and grace and worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen.
I invite you all to rise as we pray. Let us pray. Mighty God, creator of the universe, we converge from all the four corners of this world into this arena today in the city of St. Louis to honor you, to worship you, to serve you. We pray that today you will be raised, you will be honored as we, the representatives of the World Church, meet here to celebrate your doing and to hear your word. We pray, loving Father, that as your servant rises to speak in your place, that he will only be the mouthpiece of heaven. Use him to your honor and glory to unite us and to urge us to move forward to quickly finish the work. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Revelation chapter 3 and verse 11. Revelation 3 and verse 11. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. So reads the word of God. Most of us here on the Dome, we know those people, those colleagues, those leaders that are here on the platform. But I will introduce them again to you, and especially for those that are online and maybe are wondering who the people on the platform are. And I'll make sure that I don't forget anyone. I've gone over my list so that it doesn't happen what happened on uh, the second report of the uh, nominating committee a few days ago. The three leaders that our GC session has voted to be the leaders of our church for the next three years are Pastor Ted Wilson, accompanied by his wife Nancy, and I'm going to ask them to stand up as I mentioned their names. The secretary of the general conference, Pastor Ayrton Keller, and his wife Ad Adrienne and Elder Paul Douglas and his wife, Rochelle. Thank you very much. May the Lord bless them as they lead our church in the different areas that they uh, have been asked to. The vice presidents of the General Conference are as follows. Pastor Abner and Leticia de los Santos, Pastor Arthur and Galina Stelle, Pastor Guillermo and Nita Viaggi, Pastor Geoffrey and Naku Muana, Pastor Tom and Jan Lemon, and they're being accompanied by who watches over them? Aiden, if you can stand up. Thank you. Audrey Anderson, and we remember Lars, who passed away and is. We, we're waiting to see him when he re, the Lord returns. Amen. And also we have Pastor Maurice and Sharon Valentine. Thank you for being with us this morning. <laughs> the division presidents, who are also vice presidents of the General Conference, are Alex and Desiree Bryant, Eli and Kathleen Henry, Stanley and Reggiani Arco, Danielle Duda, and his wife is not able to be with us, but Viera, and I learned this morning that that means faith, 
is probably watching online and cheering for you, Daniel. Pastor Mario Brito, Pastor Harrington, and Monde Acombuena, Pastor Robert and Margaret Osei Bonzu, Pastor Johan Kim and Shin Shun Hua, Pastor Roger Kaderma and his wife Danita. And I learned also this morning that we share the same last name, so we may be related. Glenn and Pam Townen, Esras and Midrula Lacra, Blasius and Margaret Ruguri, and watching online, Mikhail and Jana Kaminsky from ESD. Thank you very much. We also have with us other parts of the world that don't belong to any division, but they belong to the General Conference. And we want to ask Pastor Bob Robert and Audrey Falkenberg from China Union Mission, Pastor Daniel and Slavi Stojanovic from the Israel field, Pastor Rick and Marcia McEdward from Middle East and North Africa Union, and Pastor Stanislav and Elena Nosov from the Ukrainian Union Mission Conference. Thank you very much. And Pastor Wilson insisted with me yesterday two times that I do not forget to bring to the platform our former and dear president of the General Conference, Pastor Jan Paulson. And last but not least, your servant, Magdiel Perez-Schulz and Susan, who keeps me straight. Let's lift up our voices in trumpet-like tones as we sing, lift up the... Oh, you got to be better than that. I hope you sing a whole lot better than what you responded. Let's go with Jesus is coming again. We're singing, lift up the trumpet. And now let it ring, Jesus is coming again. He's here on the pilgrim, be joyful and sing, Jesus is coming again. Coming again, coming again, Jesus is coming again. Beautiful echo. Echo with your tops, proclaim it the flames. Jesus is coming again. He's coming in glory, the Lamb that was slain. Jesus is coming again. He's going to do what? Coming again, coming again. Jesus is coming again. Heavings of earth, heavings of earth, hell, the wandering throne. Jesus coming again. And tempest and whirlwind, the anthem prone. Jesus coming again. Sing it loud, coming again. Beautiful. Coming again, Jesus is coming again. Nations are angry, nations are angry. By this we did. Why? Jesus is coming again. What about that knowledge? Knowledge increases, men run to and fro. Jesus is coming again. Let's close it out. 
I believe you believe that. You may be seated. I'm sorry to ask you to remain standing as we approach the throne of grace in prayer. But nevertheless, we rejoice because Jesus is coming again. Let us pray. O oh, gracious God, we have come on this Sabbath day to worship and adore your holy name. You are our God. You are our Father. You are our Lord. You are our Savior. And you are our friend. What a friend we have in you that we can bring to you all our sins and our griefs. What a privilege we have with you to carry everything to you in prayer. We come this morning, Lord, and there are many things we could bring to you but particularly, Lord, we present before you one of our sisters, Sister Annabel Omanya, wife of Ivan Omanya, or director of the Adventist Chaplaincy Ministries, who just now, in this very moment, has been transferred to hospice care as her health declines. But Lord, we believe that you are a God of miracles. And we come to you just now with this request that you would send your angels of strength. In fact, Lord, go yourself and be by her side. And if it is your will, Heavenly Father, restore her to health. Lord, this day we also request of you an outpouring of your Holy Spirit. And all of your leaders who have been appointed this week. But not only on your leaders appointed here, but all leaders of your church everywhere. And every member everywhere. You don't need us to do your work. But you have granted us the privilege, Heavenly Father, to be mouthpieces for you. So we ask, O oh God, for a fuller outpouring of your spirit, that we may have the power with which to preach, to teach, to baptize, and to share, and to show your love. We know that your coming is soon. The signs around us tell us that it is sooner than ever before. Today we commit ourselves, Heavenly Father, to get involved in our homes, get involved in our churches, get involved in our communities, because certainly you are coming again. And as we hear your word from your manservant today, hide him behind the cross. May the words that he speaks not be his words, but your words straight from the throne of grace. And as we leave this place here in St. Louis, and those who have joined online and those who watch as part of this family of faith, May we have this renewed commitment to go and lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring, for certainly 
you are coming again. These mercies we humbly ask in your name. Amen.
it's come time for us to return tithes and give offerings. And in most churches, that's all I hear as I visit around. And yet the call to worship God through giving is a real theme because we give because our Jesus gave himself for us. And Paul in his second letter to the Corinthians says in chapter 8, 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus, and that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. One of the challenges that the General Conference um, had during the pandemic was that uh, tithes and op offerings dipped a little bit, particularly in the first year. But since then, God's people have been incredibly faithful and uh, tithe has not just rebounded, but grown. Mission offering hasn't grown quite as much. And we are a people of purpose and vision. Our mission is to make disciples for Jesus all over the world in every people group and that they know the good news of the three angels' messages. And today as we give, we give to the One Year in Mission project where volunteers give up one year for the purpose of our mission, making disciples of all people groups and proclaiming the three angels' messages. So as we give, may we show our generosity and thanks to our God uh, for what he has given for us and that we believe in our young people who go out and serve as... Um, we too serve in our capacity. May God bless as we return our tithes and give our offerings.
Every general conference session is an opportunity to celebrate. To celebrate our unity, our diversity, our identity, our call, and our mission. But we are also to celebrate the ways that God uses to lead us and to lead this church. This week, through the nominating committee, and later, through the vote of the delegates, Pastor Ted Wilson was elected to be the president of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventist Church. And it's my privilege this morning to introduce him as the 20th president of our worldwide family. Usually, when you think of the leader of a worldwide family, a church established in 20 or 212 countries of the world and with almost 22 million members, a remnant people called for a special mission in these very last days. You may imagine someone close to an angel beyond human imagination. Really the task and the responsibilities of a general conference president are immense, much, much more than anybody can imagine. But what is behind someone in this position? Well, this morning I would like to introduce to you not only Pastor Ted Wilson, the general conference president, but the person behind this responsibility. Behind this leader, we can see three different aspects. A history, a family, and a human being. Let me share with you a little bit of his personal story. Pastor Wilson was born in Tacoma Park, Maryland, here in the United States while his missionary parents were on furlough from Egypt. His parents moved to Egypt in 
1944, in the midst of the World War II. They needed to use almost every mode of transportation available to journey through Africa in order to reach Cairo in Egypt because of the war. Six months after Pastor Wilson was born, they returned by boat to Egypt. And he spent his first eight years in Egypt. And he still considers the food from that region his favorite, especially his passion for olives. He is also a PK. What is a PK? An expression in English which refers to a pastor's kid. And more than that, his parents and his grandparents were all missionaries of this church. From Egypt, his family moved back to the United States. Here, Pastor Wilson earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in religious and in business administration from Columbia Union College, now Washington Adventist University. Pastor Wilson also holds a Doctor of Philosophy degree in religious education from New York University, a Master of Divinity degree from Andrews University, and a Master of Science in Public Health degree from Loma Linda University. He started his ministry in New York in 1974. After this time, God led him and his family to many different area or areas of this world for many different responsibilities. As a family, they worked and they lived in West Africa for nine years and in Russia for about four years. Pastor Wilson has served this church for almost 50 years in different capacities. He was a local pastor, he was a department director, and he was, I would like to highlight to you, he was also an executive secretary. He also served as president of the Review and Herald Publishing Association in 2000. He became a general conference vice president and in 2010, he was elected the president of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventist Church. Through God's leading in his story, Pastor Ted Wilson was prepared with an international vision, a pastoral heart, and deep confidence on the Lord to be the leader of God's church in these very special and challenging times. But the family is also a very important part of Pastor Wilson's ministry and leadership. He was raised in a pastoral home with a father and a mother very faithful and dedicated to the Lord. If we move a little further back, we'll find Pastor Wilson's grandfather, Nathaniel, as a three-year-old boy seated by the chair of Ellen White in 19,000 when she visited his home in California. Many other times, his grandfather heard messages directly from Ellen White. This is a spiritual legacy that also reached Pastor Wilson's home, a home totally devoted to the Lord and to the ministry. His father, Pastor New Wilson, was the 17th president of the General Conference from 1979 to 1990. He was a great leader, but also a special mentor for his son. His mother, Eleanor, was also a model for his spiritual life. He showed him a personal love for Jesus as a savior and a friend. He grew up loving the Lord in his cause. Unfortunately, his parents couldn't be with him in his journey 
as General Conference President. His father, Pastor Wilson, passed away some months after his election in December 2010. And his mother passed away in June 2012 or 11, six years, or sorry, six months after his father. Family is something precious for Pastor Wilson. And he really invests in his family as priority and part of his ministry. Well, how did it start? While Ted was attending Loma Linda University, he met his future wife, Nancy, a physical therapist. Today, Nancy is part of the transition ministries, working to help the spouses that move to the United States and will serve at the General Conference. But Nancy also deserves a special welcome today because she is a real partner in ministry with Pastor Wilson. She is a true prayer warrior. When Pastor Wilson speaks for an evangelistic series, Nancy has a very active participation too. She has dedicated her life to serve the Lord in different places and in very challenging situations, sometimes far from their children, alone in an overseas assignment or in different cultures and languages. Together, they raised three daughters, Emily, Elizabeth, and Catherine. They have three sons-in-law and 10 grandchildren. They like to be together, to enjoy family. And as a grandfather, Pastor Wilson likes to have fun with his grandkids. Unfortunately, last year, the family faced a very, very challenging moment when James Wright, who was almost 80 years old, passed away. Little James, son of Pastor David and Elizabeth, rest in the Lord in the arms of his mom in June of 2021, while the family together was singing, redeemed how I love to proclaim it. God renewed the blessed hope in their hearts. But this was a moment that is yet very sensitive for the family. What a challenging moment for them all. They faced this situation in God's hands, as did many of our brothers and sisters who lost their loved ones during the pandemic. But I'm glad to say to you that today, the entire Wilson family is faithful and active members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Pastor Wilson has a touching story and a lovely family. But do you know the man behind the president? I would like also to describe him. Let me use just four words to do it. Words that describe the personal or the person that I know, and you may know too. First, Pastor Wilson is a spiritual person. He is a man of prayer. It's usual to find him praying with people that meets on his way. He has a long list of prayer requests and is always available to pray for people in need but he is also a man of the word. The Bible is his daily source of wisdom and his spiritual power from heaven. It's also remarkable to see his confidence in the inspired messages from Ellen White, the books from the spirit of prophecy and his inspired messages are always with him as a source of solid orientation. 
you can be sure that the person behind the position of the president is in God's hands daily and leads the church under the leadership of the Lord. Pastor Wilson is also a strong person. It is something really remarkable. He is able to travel all night, participate in meetings the entire day, and travel back the whole night again. He spends hours in a meeting, and after, he is ready to talk, to smile, and to have fun. It's incredible. Traveling around the world, he's willing to eat any kind of vegetarian food and stay well. Many times, the colleagues that are close to him know that he's suffering because of any kind of problem or challenging situation, but he's always a smile in his face. He's really a strong person. Pastor Wilson is also a gifted person. Probably some of you, but not all, know that he's a great singer. And more, he also plays clarinet. And that he uses his handyman skills and his love for architecture in renovating his own home. Almost everything in his home, lots of gardening, fixing and construction he does alone or with Nancy. Did you know it? He writes very well and he also knows the English language with excellency. He speaks also French, some Russian. He can understand quite some Spanish and other languages. His memory is also something amazing. He is able to remember years later a name and a person that he met before. He usually arrives in a place knowing names of cities, people, and the name of each organization. And he does not forget anymore when he leaves. And the last word that can describe the man behind of this position is the word simple. He is a simple person. He has a very simple daily lifestyle. His house is a very welcoming and cozy house. His daily meals are simple and according to God's orientation. He is very careful in the use of his personal resources, but especially in the way that the resources of the church are spent. He doesn't need much to be happy and content. He likes to spend time with friends and frequently Nancy and Ted invite people to visit and eat in their home. He also loves hiking, but especially he loves to be among church members in great or small places, in places more sophisticated or in a very humble areas. He likes to stop, take a picture, shake hands, and be sure that every member of the church can find in him a pastor, not a president. Well, this is Pastor Ted Wilson, the person that our Lord chose to lead this church for the next three years. Be assured as a church member that you have a leader that is a man of God, looking earnestly for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Someone that takes very seriously his leadership nomination, that recognizes that he is working for the Lord and is very focused in the fulfillment of the mission across the street or across the world. Amen that before requesting to the church to respond to God's call saying, I will go, he and his family already said, we will go, and they went. In some minutes, Pastor Wilson 
will open God's word as our pastor and our leader, but especially as the messenger of our Lord. Please, dear brothers and sisters around the world, pray for our leader and pray for his family. They have challenging responsibilities in their hands, but if, with your prayers and your support, God will guide them and through them, God will guide our church. Please, you can feel free now to applaud and to say welcome to our leader that God elected to be the leader of the Seventh-day Adventists around the world. As we prepare to open God's Word, and Elder Wilson shares what we look forward to learning and experiencing with God, we want to have a special prayer experience. And those of you who received it, I invite you to find the little booklet that you received titled, Prayer of the Lord's Messenger. Today we are going to pray together a prayer that Ellen White herself prayed before a general conference session. I'm not sure that this has ever been done since she was alive, but there is something very special that happens in my heart, and I think many others, as we read her prayers. The White Estate has about 50 prayers of Ellen White that have been transcribed, and we are going to together pray and open our hearts to the Lord as her words and God's leading through those words can bless us in prayer. On April 1, 1903, the sixth day of the 1903 General Conference session, the clouds over the Oakland, California, Seventh-day Adventist Church cleared away and a bright, beautiful day dawned over the Bay Area on the west coast of the United States. The Lord's messenger, Ellen G. White, now 75 years old, was seeking with all her energy and influence to call the assembled delegates and other attendees to turn their hearts toward God in complete consecration. As she came to the podium, instead of beginning to speak first, she felt the call to pray. And the prayer that we are going to share together is the prayer that she prayed. The transcribed prayer was so deeply appreciated by those who were present and the leaders of the church that when the 1903 General Conference Session Bulletin was published, this prayer and actually another prayer as well that she prayed were published in this booklet. And so we will have a prayer before Elder Wilson shares his message, as Ellen White had a prayer before she shared her message. Serious things were happening in 1903 that pressed upon the hearts of Seventh-day Adventists. Major issues were under consideration at that session. These included controversial adjustments to the 1901 reorganization of the General Conference, issues of denominational ownership of Adventist institutions, and how to respond to the spirit of prophecy appeal to not centralize the work in one place, in this case, Battle Creek, Michigan, USA. The previous year, in 1902, First, on February 12, 1902, the large central building of the Battle Creek Sanitarium burned to the ground. And just months later, on December 30, the central building of the Review and Herald Publishing Association also burned. At the session, it was voted to move the headquarters of the General Conference and the publishing work to a new location. After the session, they would relocate to the Washington, D.C. area. Today, Elaine Oliver is going to read this prayer, pray it, 
And I would invite you to join me as we stand together. And I would invite you to enter into the heart of Christ through the words of this prayer. And may the Lord do something very special for us as we seek him in prayer. I invite you to stand. Let's bow our heads as we talk to our Creator God. Our Heavenly Father, you have said, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Heavenly Father, we need your Holy Spirit. We do not want to work ourselves only as we work in unity with God. We want to be in a position where the Holy Spirit of God shall be upon us with its reviving, sanctifying power. Will you manifest yourself to us this very morning? Will you sweep away every mist and every cloud of darkness? We come to you, our compassionate Redeemer, and we ask you for Christ's sake, for your own son's sake, my father, that you will manifest your power to your people here. We want wisdom. We want righteousness. We want truth. We want the Holy Spirit to be with us. You have presented before us a great work that must be carried forward in behalf of those that are in the truth and in behalf of those that are in ignorance of our faith. And, O oh Lord, as you have given to every man, every woman, in their work, we beseech of you that the Holy Spirit may impress the human mind in regard to the burden of work that shall rest upon every individual soul according to your appointment. We want to be proved. We want to be sanctified through and through. We want to be fitted up for the work and here right here in this session of the conference. We want to see a revelation of the Holy Spirit of God. We want light, Lord. You are the light. We want truth, Lord. You are the truth. We want the right way. Lord, you are the way. Lord, I beseech of you that we may all be wise enough to discern that we must individually open the heart to Jesus Christ, that through the Holy Spirit, he may come into mold and fashion us anew in accordance with the divine image. O oh, my Father, my Father, melt and subdue our hearts. We desire this morning to make an entire surrender to you. We desire to give up our will, our way, our course of action that has not been in harmony with the way and the will of God. We desire to accept the Lord's way, the Lord's will, the Lord's counsel. Come. Oh, come into the midst of us this very morning 
and move upon hearts, young and old. In a special manner, move upon the hearts of those who are handling gospel truths, that they may all be lighted up with the bright beams which you permit to shine upon your word in order that your instruction may come to the human understanding with the power and the spirit of the living God. We acknowledge before you that we have not honored your name as we should. We acknowledge before you that we need to be broken in heart. We desire just now to be reconverted. We desire just now to realize what Christ is to us and what we are and can be to him as his co-workers, God's fellow workers. Oh, my Father, let every soul that is confused, every soul that cannot understand and see the way, have the way presented before him so clearly that the mist will be removed and that the cloud will pass so that the sun of righteousness may shine into the chambers of the mind and into the soul temple. Wash us and we shall be clean, Lord. Let the melting mercy, mercy from you, come into every heart. And then when we realize the melting mercy of a compassionate and loving Savior, our hearts, once more united, will beat in unison, and all will stand shoulder to shoulder in advancing this great work. We cannot afford to be indifferent, Lord. We cannot afford to work contrary to one another. We must trust in you, and we ask this very morning that you shall let the Holy Spirit descend upon us. We are ready to receive the Comforter. We open the door of the heart and we invite the Savior in. We love you, dear Savior. You know that we love you. We see you in your matchless charms and we desire that every soul shall constantly look to you. You who are the author and the finisher of our faith. Come, Lord Jesus, come and take us as we are and put upon us the robe of your righteousness. Take away our sins, O Savior. You came to the earth to do this. We repent of our wrongdoing. We are sorry for every departure from you and we ask you to pardon our transgressions that we may show to the world that we have a savior who is able to take away our sins and to impute to us his own righteousness. Lord, we accept you now. We receive you now. We believe in you now. And we ask you to let your Holy Spirit rest upon us just now. Just now, walk through this house, we pray you, and may the angels accompanying you go around to every seat and to every heart, and may every person have a realization of what I should do. May everyone look not to man, but to Christ, to him who has died to save us. We are saved by you, Lord. We look to you, Lord. Oh, let your power come upon us to tell us that our sins are pardoned. You have promised, I will give you a new heart. We desire to have our hearts renewed, Lord. We long for this. Bless our ministering brethren. 
Bless all those who are in office in our institutions. We do not want you to destroy these institutions. We do not want to see their influence wiped away. We want that you should simply take away everything that is wrong in the heart, the life, the character of each worker so that you can use every institution of your own planting to glorify your name. We need every one of them. Oh, my Savior, you who has shown compassion to us all, again, we ask you to grant to us a rich portion of your mercy, your fullness, your compassion, your everlasting love. Come, Lord Jesus, and make us partakers of your divine nature that we may overcome the corruption that is in the world through lust. Oh, may the Spirit of Christ, the love of God, comfort every heart this morning, banish darkness, turn away the deceptive powers of the enemy, and let your voice and your spirit and your love come into our souls that we may sit together in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, and your name shall have all the glory. Amen. You may be seated. What an unbelievable privilege it is to speak after a prayer that had been enunciated by Ellen White herself. What a comprehensive prayer. What a beautiful prayer. And many of you will have a copy of that prayer in various languages. May you reread it and be blessed. I want to thank Elaine Oliver and Marlon Burt for their part in that prayer. Good morning, my brothers and sisters in Christ. And what a great privilege it is to worship together in St. Louis the Sabbath morning of the 61st General Conference Session. Brothers and sisters in Christ as a worldwide family working together in total member involvement. Praise God for the way he has led us during this abbreviated general conference session, delayed twice because of the miserable COVID-19 pandemic. Glory to our wonderful God that we can say together, yes, Lord, I will go and share the three angels' messages with the world as we anticipate Christ's soon coming. What a privilege it was last night to see total member involvement featured, all of us doing something for Jesus as we look towards Christ's soon return. I want to thank those this morning for some of that beautiful music that has been provided to us, that beautiful anthem that we enjoyed. There is power in the name of the Lord, beautifully arranged by Williams Costa. And after the sermon, you will hear another amazing arrangement this afternoon, and I hope all will be present this afternoon for a very power-packed mission presentation. Please be here. And we plan to end about 6.30 this evening and allow you to close the Sabbath on your own. Be here this afternoon. Powerful messages for mission. That's why we're here. Thank you to 
that beautiful trio that sang also, How Great Thou Art. And I want to tell you, my brothers and sisters, that is to be our theme in everything we do. Let's not lift up each other or people. Let's lift up God. How great thou art, lifting up Christ in all of his beauty. I want to thank my very close colleague, Pastor Ayrton Kohler, for his very gracious introduction. He did a lot of research on that. And I told him before we came up, I told, them, I told him, just tell them I'm your brother. Uh, he expanded on that just a little bit more than, than a one-liner. But I want to tell you, Nancy and I are so privileged to be part of your world family. We are the same as you at the foot of the cross, allowing Christ to renew our hearts every day and looking forward to Jesus' soon second coming, where we will say, how great thou art. You know, around this globe, Seventh-day Adventists have that great expectation that Jesus is coming soon. Now, I've shared that phrase in past general conference sessions in different languages. Now, please forgive me if I don't pronounce it correctly, but it is a humble effort to unite our voices in the great theme of Christ's soon coming. So listen carefully. I'll do my best. Jesus viene pronto. Jesus revient bientôt. Jésus, brevi voltera. Jésus anakuja upesi. Jésus prediot skora. Jésus nimi gold o shimnida. Jésua seyat. Serihan. Yesu Kwai Laile. Yeshu Yeldi Araha He. Malapit Nang Dumating Si Jesus. Well, I can tell a few people understood what I said. <laughs> Praise God in all kinds of other languages. You see, we share those encouraging words that are full of hope. In fact, our 2022 General Conference session theme is Jesus is coming. Get involved. What a wonderful spirit of spiritual dedication and evangelistic enthusiasm in our worldwide family, with, with so many countries and cultures in our global church family. We praise God that there is one culture of Christ that binds us together and makes us all citizens of heaven. As we study the Word of God today, I humbly ask for your prayers that the message I share is heard clearly and that only God, His infinite love, His word, His character, His righteousness will be lifted up. With that strong emphasis on the word of God and in the spirit of what I just shared in various languages regarding that marvelous phrase, Jesus is coming soon, let me attempt to share with you another wonderful biblical phrase in those languages. And again, please forgive my mispronunciation of the phrase, 
And you heard it as Audrey Anderson read it this morning from Revelation 3.11. Hold fast what you have. Let me repeat that. Hold fast what you have. By God's grace, I hope you will understand the following in different languages. And again, forgive me if it doesn't come across correctly. Reten lo que tienes. Retien, retien ce que tu as. Guarda a qui tien. Shiki li sana u li chu nacho. Tavorda dej dish. Tavo sto jest u tibia. Tang shini kashin go sul god gui cha go sib chi yo. Tamasak vima la dek. Tien sho. Nishu o yung u yu de. Ap ke pas yo hei usei pakad ker rek. Hawakan mo kung anung meron ka. Well, I probably didn't get an A plus, even a B plus on those, but I want to tell you, I want you to understand, brothers and sisters, hold fast what you have. Let us never give up the pure Bible truth as we see the signs of the second coming increasing around us. We see frequent national, natural disasters, political chaos, compromising through ecumenical activity, increase of spiritualism, instability of world economies, diminishing of biblical and moral values in society and the family, miserable pestilences and diseases such as the horrible COVID-19, abandonment of God's authoritative holy word and his Ten Commandments, increasing crime and violence and wars proliferating in many places. These and other signs point to the end of time and the imperative need to hold fast what we have. Never give up the pure Bible truth. Listen to what the Holy Scriptures say, 1 Thessalonians 5.21, test all things, hold fast what is good. 2 Thessalonians 2.15, stand fast and hold the traditions which you are taught. Hebrews 3.14, hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Hebrews 4.14, let us hold fast our confession. Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. And as our scripture was read today, Revelation 3, 11, behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. Despite the swirling chaos all around us, we can plant our feet directly and believe completely in the unchanging Holy Word of God, the Scriptures, the Bible. You see, Satan has attacked God's Word down through the ages since his defection from heaven. But God has always protected his Holy Word. And he always will. He asks us to stand up for the truth and hold fast what we believe. Seventh-day Adventists accept the Bible as it reads and as the foundation for all our religious beliefs. 
from the Holy Word, we understand Seventh-day Adventists to be God's called remnant church with a unique, peculiar, prophetic identity. It is a unique movement with a unique message on a unique heavenly mission. We are to lift up Christ, His Word, His righteousness, His sanctuary service, His saving power in the great controversy, His three angels' messages, His health message, His last day mission to the world of sharing the good news of salvation, including, and I want to emphasize this as we have been praying earnestly for the Holy Spirit here at this 2022 General Conference session and before, we need to pray earnestly for the latter reign of the Holy Spirit and Christ's soon second coming. As God's remnant people identified in Revelation 12, 17, those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, we have a special message of warning, grace, and hope in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 7, page 138. We read, Seventh-day Adventists have been chosen by God as a peculiar people, separate from the world. He has made them his representatives and has called them to be ambassadors for him in the last work of salvation. My brothers and sisters, hold fast what you have. Regardless of the many obstacles we now face and will face, let us hold fast our belief in God's word and his love for his church. His church will not fail nor fall apart. It will go through to the end under the power of the Holy Spirit. Plead for the latter reign of the Holy Spirit. As we see the world around us disintegrating in these last days of Earth's history and in response to our earnest prayers, God will pour out His Spirit on all who humble themselves and conform their lives to His will as expressed in His Holy Word and His instructions in the spirit of prophecy, thus showing His infinite love for the human race. Now, let's review for a brief time the many vital truths from God's Word that He would have us hold fast. Number one, hold fast the biblical truth that the Godhead is constituted by three divine and equal persons who have and will exist from eternity to eternity. Hold fast what you have. Number two, hold fast to simplicity in Christian lifestyle, personal dress, conduct in church life, and everyday activities. Hold fast what you have. Number three, hold fast to biblical truths and their relevancy for today, despite persecution. Avoid issues that are distractions from God's last day, three angels' messages to the world with Christ's righteousness at the core of those three angels' messages. Hold fast to the pure Word of God, not allowing any syncretistic, syncretistic or mystic aberrant theological beliefs into the Seventh-day Adventist church. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 indicates, But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 8 and 9, they say, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines, for it is good that the heart be established by grace. Hold fast what you have. 
Number four, hold fast your careful observance of the seventh day commemorating the seventh day Sabbath commemorating biblical creation accomplished by God recently in six literal days. My brothers and sisters, I earnestly appeal to you in all humility, with all due respect, with all sincerity, do not allow anyone, anywhere, under any circumstances, to negatively influence you to believe anything but Bible truth that tells us that this earth on which we are standing right now was created by God by His Word, and it was done in six literal consecutive days, days just like we experience today, recently. In fact, I will share with you my personal conviction. Some may differ with me. In the spirit of prophecy, which I believe was inspired just as God inspired all prophets, tells us that this earth was created about, and there are different words that are used in different places, about around 6,000 years ago. I want to tell you I believe that statement. By God's grace, I want you, by God's grace, I want you to understand why would you be a Seventh day Adventist if in the very fourth commandment God tells us to remember the Sabbath to keep it holy, and in, when, in reality the Lord allows us to work six days and the Bible tells us He took six days to create, capping it off with the blessed, sacred Seventh-day Sabbath. Why would you keep the Seventh-day Sabbath literally if God was telling you a big fable and story and was fooling you? Be a Seventh-day Adventist, because you believe God created this earth in six literal consecutive days recently. Hold on to your faith. Hold fast. A simple, healthy lifestyle including a plant-based diet, according to Biblical and Spirit of Prophecy Council. Hold fast what you have. Number six, hold fast to the unity in the church that God provides to all who focus their lives on Christ and His full Biblical truth. Christ Himself in Revelation 2, verse 25 says, Hold fast what you have till I come. In Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, page 324, it says, Christ is leading out a people, bringing them into the unity of the faith, that they may be one as He is one with the Father. Differences of opinion may be yielded, that all may come into union with the body, that they may have one mind and one judgment. Let's be unified in Christ. Hold fast what you have. Number seven, hold fast to God's biblical institution of marriage between one man and one woman.
God's Word confirms biblical marriage, biblical human sexuality, and the biblical family as instituted by God Himself at creation. The rampant sexual aberrations in the world are not condoned by the Bible and will not lead to eternal life. Sexual immorality in any form is to be submitted to God's power to change us into His likeness. God's ideal is to be followed, again through His power, to put us in a right relationship with His moral and natural laws. This is not an impossibility, for the Bible clearly indicates in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now, my brothers and sisters, let me tell you, we need to treat everyone with love, respect, and dignity. But I want to tell you, you draw the line in terms of what is sin and what is not sin by the Word of God. <laughs> Hold fast what you have. Hold fast in humility to spiritual and biblical respect for God's authority, showing respect for God, working in His church through appropriate bodies and careful observance of Bible and spirit of prophecy counsel. Hold fast what you have. Hold fast your great appreciation, use, and promotion of the spirit of prophecy, the writings of Ellen G. White. This is a heavenly gift to this church. I, I want to express deep appreciation to this body for what you did on Thursday when you affirmed by an enormous majority the statements affirming the Holy Word of God and the writings of Ellen White. Thank you for what you have done. What a privilege it is for us to listen to the Word of God and to share the Word of God as it reads, not as you may imagine you would like it to read. And for some of you who may, in some future meetings, find that some small group may attempt, through manipulation of parliamentary procedure, to somehow put an end to the statements of affirmation for the Word of God and the spirit of prophecy, let me tell you, God will always overrule. There is nothing, nothing that can stand in the way of pure truth, truth will always prevail. Hold fast what you have. Number 10, hold fast to biblical church growth principles and the heavenly explanations of evangelistic growth as revealed in the spirit of prophecy. Hold fast what you have. Number 11, hold fast your faithfulness to God's unique Advent movement, resisting any compromise with ecumenism and neutralization of the pure Word of God. Yes, 
Make friends with people. Explain things to people. Be a good part of the Christian community. But realize we have been called to a unique place in history as the Seventh-day Adventist Church. God intends that His church move forward without compromise on the pathway to eternal, the eternal city led by Jesus Christ Himself. Difficult days lie ahead as God's remnant people will receive everything that the devil can throw at us. In some way, trying to impede the forward advance of God's Advent movement. We know what the Omega, we know that the Omega is coming, I should say. And it will test all church members to rely completely on God to avoid great and overwhelming decept deception and compromise. Do not compromise by entering into ecumenical activities that take away and distract your understanding and belief of the Word of God. Look only to Jesus and His full biblical truth. Hold fast what you have. Hold fast to the core of our salvation and the everlasting gospel. Christ's righteousness, His justifying righteousness by faith, and His sanctifying righteousness by the Holy Spirit working in us. Christ's righteousness is what will save you. Christ and His grace and nothing else. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 10 proclaim the New Testament proclamation of what Genesis 3.15 proclaimed in the Old Testament. And for all time, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 testifies, For by grace you have been saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are His workmanship. Let me repeat that. We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In contrast to self-centered salvation by works, Christ calls us to an understanding that His death on the cross, His current intercession for us in the literal most holy place of His literal heavenly sanctuary. And yes, brothers and sisters, I believe there is a literal sanctuary in heaven and the promise of eternal life that is soon second coming. You see... We can only receive this and the many gifts he gives to us through his grace. The promise of Genesis 3.15 is about to be fulfilled when God said, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his, Christ's, heel. What a promise, packed with God's authority, saving power, future destruction of the devil, and the promise of eternal life through the victory of Christ over the devil. Hold fast what you have. Number 13, hold fast to all the wonderful 28 fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, including our understanding of prophecy, culminating with the final announcement of Daniel 8.14 and the 2,300 day-year prophecy ending in 1844, with the beginning of the investigative judgment in heaven, revealing God's great love for His people as demonstrated in the plan of salvation and sanctuary services. This prophecy and God's prophecies are rock solid and true. My brothers and sisters, don't let anyone attempt to dissuade you from believing that we need to formulate new prophetic understandings since we're in the 21st century. No, brothers and sisters, the pillars of God are sure. His word is rock solid. These wonderful 28 fundamental beliefs are all Christ-centered doctrines of the Bible. Don't let anyone tell you, oh, it's just legalism. Don't look to Jesus only. No, every doctrine we have has Jesus in the center. Hold fast what you have. 
Number 14, hold fast to your daily leaning on the Lord through personal Bible study and prayer. God's word will sustain you in all that you face. Hold fast what you have. Number 15, hold fast to simple biblical church worship patterned after Revelation chapter 4, giving glory only to God and not to human beings. Hold fast what you have. 16, hold fast to proactive, wide-scale circulation of heaven-inspired spirit of prophecy books. Be a part of the Great Controversy Project 2.0 in 2023 and 2024 and certainly right now if you want to be distributing millions upon millions of the full version of the great controversy my brothers and sisters this precious book is not the bible we believe in the bible as our only rule of faith it is the foundation but the spirit of prophecy including uh, the great controversy our message is given to us from God himself through his servant Ellen White. I believe that the spirit of prophecy is one of God's greatest gifts given to the Seventh-day Adventist Church to point us to the Bible, the written word, and to Jesus, the living word. This book, Ellen White herself said she wished that this book was circulated more than any other book she had written. My dear, my dear friends, don't let any church leader, any conference president, any union president, any division president, or even the general conference president ever tell you not to distribute the great controversy. God wants us to deliver truth to people. And this book has brought thousands, hundreds of thousands of people to an understanding of the Christian era from beginning to the future. My dear friends, be a part of the Great Controversy Project 2.0. God will bless you and your local church for it. Hold fast what you have. Hold fast your firm belief as our general conference session theme emphasizes that Jesus is coming soon and that you are to get involved. Share with the world that we can be ready for his coming, that we can hasten his coming and can share this hope of salvation through complete dependence on Christ and his justifying and sanctifying righteousness, allowing the Holy Spirit to speak through you in your personal witness and public evangelism. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, pages 116 and 117, indicates the leaders in God's cause as wise generals are to lay plans for advance moves along all the line. In their planning, they are to give special study to the work that can be done by the laity for their friends and neighbors. The work of God in this earth can never be finished until the men and women comprising our church membership rally to the work and unite their efforts with those of ministers and church officers. Total member involvement engages everyone in a year-round program of comprehensive evangelistic witnessing and outreach in all its forms. As we have already mentioned in this general conference session, last November it was a privilege to preach in a number of evangelistic meetings in the Philippines. What a marvelous combination of evangelistic outreach activities planned by the Southern Asia Pacific Division, the North Philippine Union, the Central Philippine Union, the South Philippine Union, and Adventist World Radio in conjunction with Hope Channel. Amazing miracles by the Lord. In spite of the pandemic, about 124,000 people were baptized this last year in the Philippines including more than 
1,000 people comprising former rebels and their families. At those evangelistic meetings, Nancy shared health topics and I shared the Bible truths full of hope for the second coming, full of Christ's prophetic power, full of God's authority in history and the future. I want to tell you, every time I preach those sermons, I am reassured, revived, reformed, and humbled in God's written word and the living word, Jesus Christ. I strongly urge you, all of you, if you can, to preach or to be involved with an evangelistic series this year. Pastors, church administrators, teachers, health professionals, church members, old and young, everyone, all going back to your true roots of why we're here, to proclaim the gospel message and hope of Christ's soon return. Nancy and I try to preach an evangelistic series every year. And I urge you to do the same or participate or be involved in personal witnessing. It will revolutionize your life and your personal commitment to this precious truth, reaching many with the Advent message. As our general conference session theme says, Jesus is coming, get involved, hold fast what you have. Hold fast, number 18, to biblical inspiration rejecting humanism and popular social culture that attempt to destroy God's revelation. Hold fast what you have. Number 19, hold fast to the beauty of the sanctuary and its services, which point to the everlasting gospel, Jesus Christ, the Lamb, slain on the cross. We read in Last Day Events, compilation of Ellen White's writings, page 177, the enemy will bring in false theories such as the doctrine that there is no sanctuary. This is one of the points on which there will be a departing from the faith. Brothers and sisters, hold fast what you have. Number 20, hold fast to the biblical day, year principle of interpreting biblical prophecy, allowing the Bible itself to interpret itself. The historicist approach shows us that history has accurately unfolded according to God's Word. Brothers and sisters, hold fast what you have. Number 21, hold fast to the historical biblical or sometimes referred to as historical grammatical approach to interpreting Scripture. It is the only hermeneutical approach approved by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Hold fast what you have. Hold fast to the biblical and Spirit of Prophecy Understanding, number 22, that the shaking and sifting of God's church will take place before Christ returns. Last Day Events, page 180, tells us, soon God's people will be tested by fiery trials, and the great proportion of those who now appear to be genuine and true will prove to be base metal. I want to stop there for a moment. It is only by the grace of Jesus Christ that this beautiful family of representatives from around the world will not be included in that prediction that we will only be base metal, meaning of no value. By God's grace, I hope every single one of you will be so faithful to God's word. We will all be present and waiting for Jesus to come. The church may appear as about to fall, but it does not fall. It remains while the sinners in Zion will be sifted out, the chaff separated from the precious wheat. This is a terrible ordeal. I've been quoting now, but nevertheless it must take place. Hold fast what you have. Number 23. Hold fast to the precious understanding that we are God's worldwide remnant Seventh-day Adventist Church in over 200 countries who support each other, avoiding the mission-destroying concept of congregationalism. Testimonies, Volume 6, page 27, states the whole missionary work will be farther advanced in every way when a more liberal, self-denying, self-sacrificing spirit is manifested for the prosperity of foreign missions. 
for the prosperity. This is the principle, folks. Put it in your mind. Those of you who are tempted to keep what you have, listen to this. The prosperity of the home work, the work where you are, depends largely under God upon the reflex influence of the evangelical work done in countries afar off. Let's be a world church that shares with each other. Hold fast what you have. Number 24, hold fast to the wonderful foundation of God's government based on love. His eternal law, including His Ten Commandments. We do not keep God's law through our own power, but only as we lean on Christ and His righteousness can we be secure. Let's see what Last Day Events, page 180, says. When the religion of Christ is held in contempt, when His law is most despised, then should our zeal be the warmest and our courage and firmness the most unflinching to stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us to fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few. This will be our test. At this time, still quoting, we must gather warmth from the coldness of others. Courage from their cowardice and loyalty from their treason. Brothers and sisters, hold fast what you have. And the final point here, although we're not done. Number 25, hold fast to God's special plan of health reform and comprehensive health ministry as you advocate a healthy lifestyle of God's eight natural remedies good nutrition, regular exercise, ample use of water, temperance in all things, pure air, adequate sleep and rest. And you'll get some after GC session. That's good. Trust in divine power. God's health plan rejects alcohol, tobacco, illicit drugs, and improper lifestyles incompatible with biblical and spirit of prophecy principles. Health reform is God's plan for the most abundant life possible on this earth, preparing us for Jesus' soon return. Read and follow God's counsel for health as part of the third angel's message, staying away from anything that will defile you, all through the power of the Holy Spirit. Hold fast what you have. My brothers and sisters, as we've reviewed these 25 points, and others could be added, stand firm for God's amazing biblical truth for this time. Do not be distracted, but rather focus fully on God's word and spirit of prophecy counsel, giving us connection to God, hope for the future, and a reason for being Seventh-day Adventists. In summation, Let's focus on our specific calling by God as, last, as a last day remnant church for these last days of earth's history to proclaim worldwide the three angels' messages of Revelation 14 and the corresponding fourth angel of Revelation 18. The Lord calls us to be part of his last day movement and mission. That's who Seventh-day Adventists are. God's remnant church called to present completely God's precious truths to everyone who will listen with an open heart. Allow the Holy Spirit to spiritually revitalize your life, your family, your activities, your work for the Lord, and your local church. Let's earnestly pray for the falling of the latter rain of the Holy Spirit to accomplish this work in our lives. We need revival, reformation, repentance, and humility, allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us. For the past months, we've been asking church members all over this globe to pray earnestly that the, the Holy Spirit would take control of this 2022 General Conference session. And we praise God for doing so. 
our hearts are refreshed and inspired to accomplish what God has in store for us in these last days of Earth's history. Since God formed the Seventh-day Adventist Church, His remnant church, to proclaim His three angels' messages of Revelation 14. Testimonies, Volume 9, page 19, indicates, in a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the Word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import. The proclamation, this is it, of the first, the second, and the third angel's messages. There is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. Since these messages are so central to our mission as Seventh-day Adventists, I would like to take the next few minutes, and I know we're running just a few moments late, I ask your indulgence as we finish with these important points, some vitally important points about these messages, reminding ourselves as to what God-given mission is all about. We read in Revelation 14, verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. The core of the three angels' messages is the righteousness of Jesus Christ, His justifying and sanctifying righteousness. The foundation of the everlasting gospel is based upon Jesus Christ, his righteousness and his great sacrifice for us as Christ's followers we proclaim him because we're connected to him and his righteousness in verse 7 it proclaims saying with a loud voice fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth the sea and springs of water now the first angel's voice is loud so everyone will hear and give glory and praise to God. The text indicates, for the hour of his judgment has come. Yes, we are being judged. In 1844, the investigative judgment began in the most holy place in heaven as the Lord began reviewing the lives of people down through history. One day, soon, probation will close, which is why it is vital for us to always lean on Jesus and His righteousness. This judgment is also before the entire universe, telling everyone that God's wonderful character of love is just, pure, perfect, and true. We are to worship Him who made heaven and earth and the sea which ties into the third angel's message, signifying that God is the all-powerful Creator we are to worship Him on the seventh day Sabbath, which is a distinct sign or seal of His authority. It will be one of the great controversial topics of the last days, since the seal of God is the keeping of the seventh day Sabbath, whereas the mark of the beast will be the keeping of Sunday. The time will come to make the ultimate decision of who to worship by indicating where our loyalties lie. With God by worshiping on His holy seventh-day Sabbath, regardless of the consequences, or by following the beast who has set up his false day of worship on Sunday. It is at that time that those who choose to keep Sunday will receive the mark of the beast. At that time, not before. The great controversy plainly states on pages 604 and 605, with the issue thus clearly brought before him, whoever shall trample on God's law to obey a human enactment receives the mark of the beast. The Sabbath will be the great test of loyalty, for it is the point of truth especially controverted. When the final test shall be brought to bear upon men, then the line of distinction will be drawn between those who serve God and those who serve Him not. While the observance of the false Sabbath in compliance with the law of the state, contrary to the fourth commandment, 
will be an avowal of allegiance to a power that is in opposition to God, the keeping of the true Sabbath in obedience to God's law is an evidence of loyalty to the Creator, while one class, by accepting the sign of submission to earthly powers, receive the mark of the beast, the other, choosing the token of allegiance to divine authority, receive the seal of God. Revelation 14, 8 states, and another angel followed, saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. This is the church down through the Middle Ages that continues today, led by the papacy. It will, according to Bible prophecy, Unite with apostate Protestantism and spiritualism to form the triumvirate powers attempting to force submission from all who faithfully follow the Word of God. I want to tell you we love everyone. We, re we show respect to all religions. But there is only one true God and one truth from his throne room in heaven. <laughs> Babylon is a symbol of complete confusion, chaos and the mixing of truth and error and is fallen because it represents the devil and satanic influences confusing people. Again from the Great Controversy 588, through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul, that's the false lie uh, of the devil, that something lives beyond death, which is wrong, it's not biblical, and, and I'm quoting, and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. We do not believe in the immortality of the soul, but the devil tries to bring in that deception to cause confusion and open the door to spiritualism, which will combine with the Roman power and apostate Protestantism, forming this union to confuse people. It is Babylon. Continuing in the great controversy. Through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. And under the influence of this threefold union, this country, now that's referring to the United States where we are right now, and I tell you, I am a citizen of this country and I thank God for this country, but I want to tell you, this is what the future holds. This country will follow in the step of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. This is not a conditional prophecy. It confirms Revelation 13 and 14. The United States, represented by the two-horned beast of Revelation 13, 11, will repudiate the very foundations upon which it was founded. Its two horns, representing republicanism, that's not the party, that's the form of government, and the other representing Protestantism, this two-horned beast will create an image to the beast through a national Sunday law. You can count on it. It's coming. Revelation 13, 12 states, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes in the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. This clearly shows that the image to the beast, the United States, combined with apostate Protestantism, will initiate activities to support the beast and a Sunday law and will make the whole earth worship the beast whose deadly wound is healed. There will be national and international Sunday laws that will deprive all Bible-believing Christians worldwide of their religious liberty and freedom of conscience. The devil, his supporters, and his false day of worship will appear to have triumphed, but it will not last long. God's great sign of his authority as creator, the seventh day Sabbath, will be the seal of his people and will triumph forever when Christ returns to take his people home to heaven. Revelation 14, 9 and 10, 
say, then the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or in his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. So receiving his mark in the forehead represents a conscious acceptance and belief of the beast's instructions. Receiving the mark in the hand represents that even if you may not believe the instructions, you will sacrifice your eternal life simply to temporarily save your current physical life. Last day events, 224, the mark of the beast is the papal sabbath when the test comes it will be clearly shown what the mark of the beast is it is the keeping of sunday the sign or seal of god is revealed in the observance of the seventh day sabbath the lord's memorial of creation the mark of the beast is the opposite of this the observance of the first day of the week brothers and sisters lean on christ his holy word, and his spirit of prophecy as we prepare for what is soon to come. Ponder this from last day events, pages 136 and 137. The whole world is to be stirred with enmity against Seventh-day Adventists because they will not yield homage to the papacy by honoring Sunday, the institution of this anti-Christian power. All Christendom will be divided into two great classes. Now, I'm telling you, in my words, only two, not three or four, only two. Those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, and those who worship the beast and his image and receive his mark. The three angels' messages end with marvelous verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. By God's grace and power, let's keep all the commandments of God and have complete faith in Jesus. As the three angels' messages are proclaimed, the Holy Spirit will guide us to be unified. In Principles for Christian Leaders, page 306, we read, his transforming grace upon human hearts will lead to unity that has not yet been realized for all who are assimilated to Christ will be in harmony with one another. The Holy Spirit will create unity. I am instructed to say to Seventh-day Adventists the world over. Now, when you read a phrase like that, listen well. God has called us as a people to be a peculiar treasure unto himself. He has appointed that his church on earth shall stand perfectly united in the spirit and counsel of the Lord of hosts to the end of time. When the powerful injunctions of the third angel are proclaimed, there will be unusual responses. In Principles for Christian Leaders, page 307, we read, Heretofore, those who presented the truths of the third angel's message have often been regarded as mere alarmists. Their predictions that religious intolerance would gain control in the United States, that church and state would unite to persecute those who keep the commandments of God have been pronounced groundless and absurd. It has been confidently declared that this land, talking about this country, could never become other than what it has been, the defender of religious freedom. And thank God today for the religious liberty allowed to us by this government in this country to meet in this arena today. Praise God for that. But going on in reading, but as the question of enforcing Sunday observance is widely agitated, the event so long doubted and disbelieved is seen to be approaching. And the third message will produce an effect which it could not have had before. So my dear brothers and sisters, as you can tell, this is a serious message. And I thank you for your patience. I labored 
on this message. I want you to share these precious three angels' messages with heavenly kindness and Christian love. Don't beat people over the head with it. Share it with a smile. These messages not only have a strong warning, but they have great hope through the righteousness of Christ as revealed in the everlasting gospel. So don't get weary or discouraged. Don't give way to complaining and skepticism. Do not turn away from the Lord and the task he has entrusted to us. Look to Jesus Christ and live as you respond to God's instructions for his last day people. We are on the edge of the promised land as we view the approach of Christ's soon second coming. But the devil wishes to discourage us just as he did with the Israelites before their entrance into the promised land. They'd been wandering in the desert. You know the story. They became weary and tired. They bitterly complained against God. They lost their focus on what God had in store for them as his people of promise. Numbers 21 verses 4 through 9 say, Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food, no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. Talking about manna. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord, and against you pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Thank God for praying people. My friend Pat Langley, you are a prayer warrior. You're seated down here in the third row. May God bless you and so many others who are prayer warriors for God. Moses prayed. And then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten when he looks at it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and he put it on a pole. And so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, that he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Our only salvation at this time of skepticism, doubt, cynicism, resentment against God is to look to Christ and live. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 430. The lifting up of the brazen serpent was to teach Israel an important lesson. They could not save themselves from the fatal effects of the poison in their wounds. God alone was able to heal them, yet they were required to show their faith in the provision which he had made. They must look in order to live. It was their faith that was acceptable to God. And by looking upon the serpent, their faith was shown. <clears throat> they knew that there was no virtue in the serpent itself. But it was a symbol of Christ and the necessity of faith in his merits was thus presented to their minds. My dear brothers and sisters, don't lose your faith in Jesus Christ and his promises for his last day remnant people, the Seventh Day Adventist Church. Look up to Christ, his merits his righteousness, his everlasting biblical truth, and we will live. In the Ellen G. White Estate offices at the General Conference headquarters, a large painting called Christ of the Narrow Way portrays God's people moving along a treacherous pathway. Many of you may have seen it and been impressed by how veteran Seventh-day Adventist artist Alfred Lee depicts Ellen White's vision showing the tribulations and the triumphs of God's last day remnant church as it moves along the ever narrowing pathway. As long as God's people, both individually and as a united body, keep their eyes fixed upon Christ at the front of the pathway and do not compromise their faith, they are safe. 
Let's stop looking to each other. Stop looking to so-called experts. Stop looking to worldly influences. Stop compromising. Stop looking to errant theological thinking. Stop looking to humanly devised church growth methods and turn our eyes upon Jesus and his heavenly instructions. Jesus Christ is the true leader of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I am not. I'm just a humble servant along with you. Jesus is the only one who can guide us safely to our heavenly home as we look to him alone each and every day. And one day, very soon, we will look up in the eastern sky and see a small cloud approaching, about half the size of a man's hand. We will realize it is the second coming of Christ, and that cloud will get brighter and brighter and larger and larger. All of heaven poured out for this climactic event, and in the middle of that cloud, we will see Jesus. We will say, this is the God that we have waited for, and he will save us. Jesus will look down and say, well done, good and faithful servants. Enter into the joy of your Lord, and we will ascend to heaven together. I long for that day. You'll see your loved ones who have died in the Lord. But the most important thing, we will see Jesus. You'll look around and you'll see those whom you've invited because you said, yes, Lord, I've held fast the truth you gave us. I engaged in total member involvement. And I said, yes, I will go and be part of sharing God's last day message to this world. You see, friends, Jesus said in that heavenly council of peace with the Father, I will go to earth and give my life. He said to his disciples, go into all the world. And he says to us, go. For as we prepare for Christ's soon return and the Lord to see our precious Savior appearing, we will be sent by him. What a privilege to follow Jesus' example in going. What a day that will be when Jesus will come and we shall behold him. Charles Huggabrooks has been leading us in music. What a privilege to work with Charles. Pastor Mark Finley and I have been working with Charles in evangelistic meetings just recently in Indianapolis. What an amazing opportunity to see God at work in the hearts of people and the messages that God sings through Charles. And he's joined today by Anika Anderson. What a privilege it is to have the two of them sing together. We shall behold him. Shall applaud with thunder a prayer, sweet light in his eyes shall shall enhance those 
all the way and we shall be whole him then face to face we shall be Thank you so much, 
Charles and Anika, my brothers and sisters around the world, those of you viewing and live streaming, those of you here in the auditorium, if you want to behold the coming King and commit yourself to Christ and his precious, precious final Advent movement, and you wish to say, yes, Lord, I will get involved and through the power of the Holy Spirit proclaim your infinite love and share your last day three angels' messages with a world in need of the good news of the everlasting gospel. As we approach Christ's soon coming, would you join me in standing in commitment to this call right now? Amen. Our gracious Father in heaven, you see your people standing before you. After this majestic anthem which has pointed us to Jesus soon coming when we shall behold Jesus. Now, Lord, send your people on their way. Give them Holy Spirit power to not only proclaim but to live the precious word of God. Lord, we entrust ourselves into your hands. Use us. As we say, yes, Lord, I will go. Lord, use us to share with others the precious love of God, his character, and his soon second coming. Thank you for hearing us in this prayer. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Please remain standing for our last anthem, and then we will have the benediction. God bless every one of you.
Let's pray. Lord, there's nothing we long more for than to see your face, than to see you coming in the clouds of glory and to rejoice because you have called us by your name. As we have heard your word today, we commit ourselves to stand in your grace, hope, and truth. We ask that you will give us the strength to hold fast until you come. And Lord, until that day, we long to do your work as your servants to spread the message to every kindred, tongue, tribe, and people across this planet. We commit ourselves to go because you have asked us to take your blessings to the world. We do this in the name of Jesus because he has commanded us to take his message to every person in this planet. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings of today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for watching and for being a part of our worship experience here at Kendallwood. Now, if you've been blessed and you want to be a blessing, please go to our website, kendallwood.com, and under the Given tab, you'll see ways to support our ministry. Also on our main page, you'll be introduced to a number of different ministries and activities that are happening here uh, with the Kendallwood family. And if you want to be a part of this, or if simply you have a prayer request or something you want to share or ask, please uh, call us or email us at communications at May God richly bless you as you seek to serve him today.